find their seats. Thank you. And we're going to worship our God together today. But very shortly, Pastor Phil is going to come and give you the announcements just to remind you of things that are coming up this week. wonderful to be able to have you here and worthy is the lamb hey worthy is the lamb who has been slain so that we could have our sins forgiven be set free and be called children of God it's wonderful to have you here joining with me uh, and us together I'm Pastor Philip if you don't know who I am and it's a great time to be able to come and share with you this morning. After the service, we've got some great things happening up in the hall. So as you um, go up the ramp, you'll see a table set up where we, this um, through August, have May Mission, uh, sorry, um, Mission Aviation Focus or Fellowship where we're able to go and grab a box. There's a little box that you can put little, um, your coins in that you have in your pockets that tinkle and get annoying. You can put them into there. And then at the end of the month, at the, on Father's Day, we gather all them together, and that proceeds goes to support uh, Mission Aviation Fellowship, which goes and supports people in need in uh, greater regions where we can't get in contact with cars and things like that. It's beautiful. We'll keep you in the loop this month what that is all about. So we'd love for you to go and have a look at that. Also, you'll see in the back of the hall on the left-hand side that there is a table with a black tablecloth. We've got two friendly people sitting there um, after the service, Lynn and Frank. They're going to be starting to take registrations for the church camp that is going to be coming up on the 4th to the 6th of October. So um, if you want to go and get a registration and have a look at that, or if you know you're coming and you want to fill it out, um, you're welcome to do that. There's two ways of making payment for the church camp, either online through our uh, direct deposits, which you will find the details on the back of the bulletin, um, or you can pay by cash um, up there to Lynn and Frank through the petty cash tin as well. Um, so I'd love for you to, to have a look at that. We've also, through this time, we have um, our Operation Christmas Child boxes. If you look out towards the door, you will see these boxes there that Glennis is waving around as our wonderful model with the boxes. Um, if you are wanting to pack a box or two, go and see her um, out in the foyer and she'll give you that and the information of what you can pack in your boxes. So that's a couple of things for this afternoon or the after the service that you can look at. Also coming up, um, tomorrow morning we have our ladies morning tea coffee happening at the Windmill Cafe. If that's open for any ladies who would like to come to that, it's at 9am at the Windmill Cafe and it's always a great time of chatting, I've heard. So that's wonderful. Um, go and have a look at that and enjoy the fellowship uh, together. We've also then got on Tuesday... We have the Ladies Fashion Parade and the Care Hub Morning Tea happening afterwards. If you haven't bought a ticket, I'm sorry, but they are all sold out, um, which is a wonderful thing to celebrate that um, it has missed its cap, which is wonderful. Keep praying for the team as they come to prepare for that day, and it's going to be an exciting time where people come, look at different things, and raise funds to be able to support the Care Hub ministry. If you don't know what the Care Hub ministry is, it's a ministry, a ministry arm or a care arm of the church that goes towards supporting those people in our community who are needing provisions physically or support emotionally and mentally. And so it's a beautiful ministry. We have an opportunity if you want to. If you've got spare clothes or clothes you don't wear anymore, you want to drop them off there, they then fill their um, coat hangers up full of uh, clothes and anybody who is need can come 
and, and come and get some great provisions and support in that way um, through those uh, givings. And one of the beautiful, generous things is it is for free. So people can come and grab what they need and feel like they have um, um, been blessed by us as a church through the Care Hub. So I encourage you to consider what that looks like for you. Also, in providing for that, the Care Hub team has also got a shopping trolley up in the hall down the back corner where if you come with any foods or provisions that you'd like to contribute, um, when you go shopping, buy something extra and then come on Sunday and put it into that box and, or that trolley and they use those to be able to provide uh, care packages to people who are in need and needing some food from there as well. We have our um, kids take over service next week and all the kids say, and, and the grown-ups as well, it's wonderful. It is an amazing time where we see the kids come and they take over all the service but one part. And I've told the young people, because someone was really eager, can I preach this week? I went, no. I'm still going to do the preaching, but we let the kids do all the rest. Um, so it's going to be a wonderful time next week as the kids come and do our takeover service. As I share in many times, our kids takeover service has two things. One, it shows our kids that they are an important and significant part of our church that aren't meant to be seen and not heard, but rather seen and heard and blessings to us. And through that, we are also blessings to them. The second part, that this is the second step. For any families that have come through our outreach ministry of uh, Kids Club and any other means, this is an opportunity for them to come into our Sunday service and feel welcomed and loved and being a part of our bigger church for, uh, family. So um, if you see new people coming next week with kids, I encourage you at morning tea, please go and say hello. Make them feel welcome um, and let them experience God's love through you as well. At the end of next week's service... We have our church family picnic, which is going to be an amazing time. If you go out to Nielsen's Beach, as you're going towards there, you'll see a park with a soccer field and basketball hoops, and for some of us like me, some exercise machines um, and those sort of things, that's where we're going to be having our picnic. So come along, bring a, um, a chair or a rug, and let's come enjoy our fellowship together with our church picnic. Bring a ball or a basketball, and um, let's have heaps of fun. And please play for me. I sometimes forget how old I am, and there is a big chance that I'm going to pull a hemi as I try to compete with our younger, more fit people in a game of soccer. So um, let's just pray for God's protection over me, and let me score a, tr a goal, yeah? <laughs> It's going to be great. So that's going to be great. Um, it's going to be heaps of fun. There's so much more information in your um, uh, bulletins here that we'd love for you to get to, to know. If you're new and you'd like to know more information about the church, you'll see on the bottom of the front page there's a QR code. Feel free to scan that. Throw any questions to us that you would like to ask and we'll reply to you as soon as we can. And there's also another one down on the bottom right, which is our prayer request. If you've got any prayers that you would like for the church elders and the stewards to be praying over, please send them through that QR code and we'll be praying for you and those needs that you have um, as well. There is so much information in here, so I encourage you to have a look. There's the newcomers lunch coming up next week. Um, not next week, when is it? Two weeks' time. See, we all make mistakes sometimes. Last week, Linda said that the, the, the fashion parade was the Sunday just gone. This week, I've done the other way with the newcomers. But in two weeks' time, we have a newcomers' lunch. If you would like to know more information about our church and who we are, what we believe in, and what our vision is that we believe God has given to us for the future then I would encourage you to come and see uh, us and do that. If you want to know more, if you want to um, put your name on the list, Daryl, who's standing on the ramp with a, a black jacket like I've got on, sort of, go and see him, and he would love to put your name on that list and be able to come. We do do an awesome um, lunch, so if that's ever, ever a lure. It's actually one of the best meals. You know what, be what meals are the best meals? Free meals. And so this is one of the best meals because it's a free meal uh, for you from there. So please go and see him if you're new um, and would love to be able to plug you in from there. Also, I want to be able to share that coming up very shortly, we're going to be taking up our normal offering uh, for our church. This is a time for us as a church to be able to give back um, to what God is doing. We're, we're going to be giving that um, into the, in, in the next song as we come to sing the next song. 
But then I want to be able to share that today we're also doing a special offering. You may have seen that we have our, um, our sensor systems and our security uh, cameras and things put up on the outside. We want to be able to pray, uh, pl pay a very big thank you to those who um, came and did the hard work of installing it. I don't know if they want to be made known, so we'll just let's give them a round of applause to say thank you uh, for that generous work that they've done. But also we had to pay for the cost of that and it's outside of what our normal budget is. So we're opening the opportunity for us as a church to be able to help contribute towards the cost um, of that. We originally got a quote of $6,000 for the um, cost of providing and installing and through the installation and a cheaper price of the same or better uh, material, we've been able to see that cost come down to just over $3,000. So praise God that that has been done. And now we get to be a part of that, contributing to cover that cost. We're going to do that um, and further in the service. So we're going to do two offerings, um, just so that we don't awkwardly um, miss, miss who's got what and what's happening there. So we're going to do two offerings. The first one's our normal, and the second one later in the service is going to be our special offering from them. If you haven't come to be able to give in that way, you also can put it through the direct deposits. Please just mark it as security so that we know what that is being contributed to um, in, in our bank account. So let me pray, um, and then we're going to come and sing a song and, and take up our offerings uh, from there. So gracious Father, we want to thank you that we are able to come into this house to worship you. I thank you, Lord, for the kids. We thank you for the joy it is that they can come and worship with us this morning and then go and be a part of learning about Jesus in a meaningful way that is directed to them. We pray, Lord, for the kids' church leaders. We pray for the courage leaders. Lord, we pray for your blessing on them. And through them, Lord, I pray that our kids will be blessed as well. And Lord, as we come to give uh, an offering back to you, Lord, we thank you for the way that you provided to us in so many ways. You are the great Jehovah Jireh. And Lord, as we give back, I pray, Lord, that we will have a heart of worship an attitude of thankfulness as we give and let this be an act of worship as we give to you according to what you have provided for us. Lord, bless these funds and I pray, Lord, that us as a church will be a blessing to our community as we use these funds according to your will and as good stewards, we pray. We pray this in Jesus' name and God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may like to stay seated if that's easier for dealing with offering. If not, please feel free to stand from the start. But we're going to sing and praise and spend some time worshipping and talking with our God.
take care of you, not abandon you, plans to give you the future you hope for. Have you known God to speak to you and ask you, what is the future you hope for? He did that for me 12 years ago. Gosh, I was... <laughs> and it was like, wow, I don't know what future I hope for. And I had to think about that. And then God said, what do you want? And I said, I want to be a mentor. I want to encourage people. And I see over the last 12 years how the opportunities have come to do that. When you call on me, when you come to me and pray to me, I'll listen. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. If you don't know Jesus, but you're here seeking him, ask him and you will find him. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and you want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life, Lord, you've been faithful. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath.
You are an amazing God, and we just love you and want to praise you this morning. time talking with you and hearing from you. Thank you that you invite us to come and spend time with you. What an awesome privilege that is, that you invite me to come into your presence and just talk with you, share my heart with you, share my life with you, that you want to be part of me part of us, part of our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you care about 
our health and we lift up those in our church family who are not well. Some with flu, colds, some of us battling cancer, some of us with continuous migraines, whatever that be. Lord, I ask that we would know your peace. We would know that even if, even if you never heal us, even if we are with that illness for the rest of our lives, that you deserve and are worthy of our honour and praise and you have not turned aside from us. You are not neglecting us. But your plans for us are for our good and your plans are for something bigger, bigger and better than just how well we are. Thank you, God, that you use us and you work through us to share who you are and your love and your grace and your mercy. May we be open always to seeking out our friends and our neighbours who don't know you and to share you with them. Oh, Lord, I pray for them that you would, Holy Spirit, you would cultivate that ground. You would open their hearts to invite you in, to seek you, to acknowledge that you exist. Oh, Lord, just we want you to be known by our friends and our neighbours, by this community, to know that God is real and you love them and you care for them so much that you died for them. Lord, we thank you for the blessings you have given us, for the way you have provided for us. You take care of us. You will not let us go. And you provide for what we need. And you bless us abundantly. I thank you for that. And so with joyful hearts, out of that blessing, we come this morning to give you a special offering. To take care of these buildings that you have prov- and resources you have provided us with. Lord, I ask for your protection over this whole site. We want this to be a safe place, a safe place for children, a safe place for adults, a safe place for young people. Lord, just be sovereign over this site, protect it. We ask that people who come here will seek you and find you. So Lord, as we give this offering, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Please be seated. And the offering stewards would like to take up that special offering now. Thank you. And as we do, we will start to sing as another song to just help us prepare for, remind ourselves of why, who is blessing us. Bye. 
invite you to stand. And I ask the kids, if you would like to go out to Kids Church, now's your opportunity. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created beings, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the music team for the lovely singing this morning. It was wonderful. And sets the scene for our communion this morning. And I'd just like to share some thoughts with you before we share in communion today. I'm focusing today on 1 Corinthians 11.28. And it tells us that everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. As we come today to our time of communion, I thought it would be good to reflect on our attitude as we come to this time. I was thinking as I prepared, to, prepared for today, how many times I had taken communion during my life. And I calculated that it would probably have been at least 600 times, probably more, as I've been a Christian since I was 18. There will be some of us here who have celebrated more and some less. How many times we have come to the Lord's table is not so important, but our attitude as we come each time is very important. As I reflected, I found that there were three ways that I had identified for myself in coming to the Lord's table over my Christian walk with Jesus. A sense of ritual, an obligation of duty, and an overwhelming thankfulness. Firstly, ritual. It is easy sometimes to get into a rut and just roll along with life where one week leads to the next and communion is just one of those things that we do at the beginning of each month. I have experienced this in times when my life was relatively easy. Jesus was there 
but not at a personal or daily part of my life. A sense of duty. This sense of duty is a big one for me. When I was going through the motions, because the Bible says so, I've experienced these feelings when Jesus seemed distant from me and it felt like he had abandoned me. But really, I had been distant from him. Often this had been in the sad and difficult times of my life. And lastly, thankfulness. Truly, this is the place I am today and have been mostly through my Christian walk. For without Jesus dying and rising back to life, as he said he would, we have no hope for our future. I am so thankful that Jesus, though sinless, took my place and suffered on my behalf. This is something that I still find difficult to comprehend. That Jesus would do that for me? What amazing love. For it is only through this act of grace that God sees me as pure because of the cleansing work on the cross that Jesus did on my behalf. Yes, I am so thankful. I'm certainly not proud of the fact that these attitudes have been part of my approach to communion on my Christian journey. But Jesus still loves me. Some of you are probably feeling the same today. So if you find yourself in a place where you are struggling in your walk with Jesus, you are not alone. But know that he truly loves you because he died and rose again on the third day for you, for you. So to all of us who have given our lives to Jesus, let us come to this communion time with thankfulness in our hearts that what Jesus has done for us, God, see, God sees us as pure because of Jesus' life given freely for each one of us. Jesus sees us as pure. God sees us as pure. If you have not accepted Jesus, please let these elements pass you by, as this is the time when we as believers remember the saving works of Jesus. The bread is gluten-free. Take and eat the bread in your time, but hold the cup so we may drink together. Let me pray. Father God, as we take these emblems of the bread and the juice in remembrance of you dying on the cross for us, help us to come with thankful hearts and with humble hearts as we, we know the blessing that you have been to us, that God sees us as pure because of your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. And Lord, we just pray your blessing on us today. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Let's drink together. Father God, we just thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us each day. We are just so appreciative of all that you've done for us so that God can see us as pure in his sight. For without you, we are lost. We are so thankful. We are so thankful. Amen. If you could pass your glasses to the end of the row as, uh, and uh, someone will come and collect them for you. Thank you. I thought it would be fitting for us this morning as we come to prepare to hear the word to let's stand as we come to uh, receive the reading of the word this morning out of Ruth chapter 1 verse 2 to thir- uh, 5 to 13 but we're actually going to be starting in verse 1 so Ruth chapter 2 um, let's read it now Naomi had a, a relative on her husband's side a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. It just so happened. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem. Isn't that just another marvellous coincidence? And greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. And the Lord's bless, uh, may the Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field, has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in any other field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars and the men that the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground, and she asked him, Why have you found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? 
Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord and God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. Let me pray. Gracious Father, as we come here to draw into your word, to understand and to be able to gather how we may apply it into our lives, I pray, Lord, that we will see your love, the love through your people and your provision and where we are able to come and find refuge in you as well. I pray, Lord, (coughs) that this morning you will bless us. Lord, that we will come and see and ask why would the creator of this world who made all things notice us a mere person, a mere sinner. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless us as we consider this and your word we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Feel free to be seated. And can we just acknowledge that we have a new piano player this morning? Thank you, Sharon. It's lovely uh, to be able to have you here with us. And you may have seen in the bulletin that uh, the elders have brought the name of Sharon and her husband Adrian, a uh, recommendation for them to come into membership, which you will see proceeding. Dad, Dad has spoken. You know, Millie yesterday came, um, Millie's my eldest daughter, she, she came, we had Linda's sister, um, Aunty Allison, they call her over at our place this weekend, and Millie last night brought out all her medallions uh, for her gymnastics, and also at school she won um, a, a music uh, choir award, and the other person who won the, the, the choir award for the older school was Elliot on the same night, which was an amazing, exciting news from that night, but she brought, yeah, she, she brought these um, beden- medallions and this trophy out, and, and she was showing Alison, and she was showing everyone, and, and she came and showed Linda and told her the story about what happened on that night, and how she thought she was tired and wanted to go home, but she's lucky she stayed so that she could get that award and she showed it to me and Linda's like, you know we know this. We were there. (laughs) And she said, oh, but aren't we glad? I said, yes, we are glad. And when you received that trophy, I know that the teachers up the front said, please do not yell out when your children come forward, but hold your clap and applause until the end. Well, when I got the rude, well, not rude, excited surprise that Millie was getting the award and no other of the junior school got that award, I was ecstatic. So when she got up on stage, I was that awkward, embarrassing, proud dad that went, that's my daughter. (laughs) Gray, and I'm glad I'm not the only one. And Sharon, I'm glad that he's still allowed to do that, even though you're now 21. Well, this morning, we're drawing into Ruth chapter 2. We started last week looking at Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, so we're not going to be diving into that too much. And the week before, we looked at Ruth chapter 1 in its entirety. So if you want to go and look at those passages, go online, and we encourage you to, to, to go back and look at them. But this morning, I want to introduce to you the man of the moment, Boaz. I want us also then to look at Ruth in her character of humility and her industrious, hard-working spirit. And lastly, I want us to consider God's gentle, merciful provision as we read out of this chapter. So first, let's look at Boaz. Boaz 
came and entered the field and he saw Ruth. He spoke to his leading hand and said, wow, look at her. Who is this Boaz? Well, Boaz, in chapter 2, verse 1, we get an insight to who Boaz is. It says in verse 1, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Boaz's name means strength. And this brings significance in contrast to the two other men that we saw previously in the lives of Ruth, which were Malon and Kilion, whose names were Sick and Dying. And now you've got Mr. Strong coming onto the scene. But further to this verse, this verse says that Boaz was a man of standing. This word in its original text was Kargil. Can anybody say Kargil? And when you go home, can you please write that Hebrew text that you can see? Um, ju- just, just uh, where's my little pointy thing? That one. So memorize that so that you can go home and write. And next week I'll do a spelling test to see if you can remember it. So Carl or Car Car Hill or maybe is that where your name comes from, Nathan? Car Hill, Carl, maybe means strength. Uh, from there, but we, we see this, this word, and this, this word was most commonly used in the standing of or describing of an army, an army, particularly God's army, or, or warriors. And then it distinguishes them with power, with strength, with efficiency, with wealth, with valor. And with honour. For this book to write that Boaz was a man of standing, that holds him in pretty high regard, yeah? So as the readers or as the listeners, when they were coming to hear this at the festives, festivities, heard that Boaz, as a man of standing, they would have been like, oh, here he comes. This is exciting. Now, although this does not explicitly say, and we have to be careful reading into the unknown, we could see that this suggests to us why Boaz, a godly man, a land owner, who was wealthy and a worthy suitor for so many of the women in Bethlehem and for Israel afar, was still single or was single. It could be because he was, from his youth, into most of his adult life, being uh, in the military defending God's people, where his purpose and primary focus was on raising up and leading men in the Lord's army. And now retired from his service, has come home to take his place within his clan in Bethlehem. Now, be sure that this word, this Bible, the scriptures don't speak directly into this, but there is a space to be able to consider that his priorities were elsewhere rather than having a wife and having children. The other commentary statements of presumption, I guess you could say, is that Boaz did have a wife that he loved so dearly, but maybe through childbearing, she and the child passed away. But we don't know. But what we do know is Boaz is an eligible, suitable, honourable, single man. Boaz, a man of standing from the clan of Limelech. Now, this is where I see an undertone of the book of Ruth comes alive. For when they talk about the clans, if Ruth was married to Malon they genuinely would have st- spoken in the, fact, in the fact of a redeemer that Elimelech came from the clan of Malon because that was the line in which the redeemer was going to come. But what we can see here is that the scriptures don't talk about the line of Malon 
but rather that Boaz came from the clan of Elimelech. Last week I described Naomi to be like the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7 that approaches Jesus with his, his response being first in verse 27, first let the children eat all they want, he told her. As she pleaded with him to hear her and, and hear her pleas that, she, that, she, that Jesus would heal her daughter. And Jesus responds and says, first let the children of Israel eat. In other words, she was not welcome at this table. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. That seems quite rude, doesn't it? But in her humility, this Syrophoenician woman, in seeking a miracle, states, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Naomi, coming back to Bethlehem, came and found herself empty, came and felt that she was withdrawn from God's blessing because God hasn't pulled out blessing on her, but rather has removed the blessing from her, and she was coming empty, but rather she had heard the blessing that had come on God's people in Bethlehem, and she knew that the place that she needed to be was in the presence of God's people who were receiving blessing that maybe, just maybe, she may get the remnants of that blessing poured out upon her. But do you know how Jesus responded to the Syrophoenician woman as she made this statement that even the dogs under the table received the scraps? He responds in a sense of amazement of her faith. For such a reply, he says, you may go. The demon has left your, body, uh, your daughter. God has produced a miracle for the daughter. But in this story, God produced the miracle for the daughter, but the blessing was given to the mother. The story of her great faith was living forevermore in the passages of Mark chapter 7. Now, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, God was going to do an amazing through, uh, thing through Ruth and Boaz, but the blessing here is coming to Naomi. For if it was for Ruth, then the Redeemer would have been from the clan of Malon and Ruth's deceased, uh, Ruth's deceased husband. But Boaz was from the clan of Elimelech, showing that God was going to bless this grieving widow who had turned home so that she may at least receive the blessed crumbs of God and God's children. Now, when a man dies without producing a son, who would receive the father's inheritance? The son. And the son would then bear and carry the name of the deceased man. But we will soon find that Boaz is not the first in the line to redeem Elimelech. If we remember the story of Tamar, does anybody know the story of Tamar? One of those stories that we generally don't share too much with children in the room. But Tamar married the eldest son of Jacob, the guy by the name of Ur. But when she married him, he died before she was able to produce a child. And so then when she, when she then, then Jacob then instructed the second oldest son to then go and lay with her so that she would then produce a son who would then become the heir of the eldest son, Ur, and receive the inheritance that he was going to get. But guess what? What happened? The, the, the second oldest brother, what did he do? Well, don't need to go into too much detail. But rather, he restrained his blessing through producing a son from her, to which then the next oldest son came into the place. And then that next oldest son, what happened? He withheld the blessing from her. And so she was not able to produce a child to carry the name of Ur. So what Tamar did, she knew that Jacob was traveling into town. And so she went to see, like, just quietly, dressed her up as a person who a man would find when he was lonely in a cold night to find favour. He met her at the gate and they then had a contractual agreement where he did the deed and she carried a son. 
But in that time, Tamar said to him that promise me, I'll identify who I am in a later date, but I want you to give me your staff so that you will know who I am. And later, when Jacob went back to his village area and they found out that Tamar was pregnant, he was furious. Who did this? To which, what did Tamar do? She brought out the staff and she said, you did this. Jacob was cut to the heart to realise that she did what she needed to do to honour his eldest son who had deceased, even when even he would not be willing to do it. And so he blessed her in this space. And so we see that the lineage and the understanding of the Redeemer is the responsibility of the eldest son of the clan. So when we see that Boaz later says to her in this moment, fast forward, telling a little bit of a story, um, but that, sorry, Boaz says, sorry, I can't redeem you. There is another who is your closer redeemer. We see that there must be an older brother, which I would make the assumption here is the, actually the older brother of Elimelech. And then Boaz is the second or the next in line under Boaz, or some say maybe the eldest of the cousins from the line of Elimelech. So what do we see here? Why do I share this? Well, we see that he is of the same generation as Elimelech. So Elimelech, you would say, if Ruth was married to Elimelech when she was about 14, 15, and he was about 18, we would see that in this stage when Naomi was about maybe early to mid-40s, then he was obviously late 40s to early 50s. He was an older of a man. And when they're of that age, the older of a man of that age should have been held as an elder, where he should have been able to take and give all of his work and his responsibilities to his son, and then he would take his place at the gates of Bethlehem as one of the elders. But he did not have a son. And so he then gave the responsibility to his overseer, his leading hand on site, so that he could still go to town and still have these times of relaying and engaging with the affairs of the people of Bethlehem. And then he would then come back to the field and talk to and speak to the overseer in those appropriate times. And lastly, Boaz is a man of great faith who carries himself with integrity. We see this by the way that he greets his workers and how he responds in prayer towards Ruth. Something that we all would do well to emulate. To be a person that carries our faith not just in our hearts but on our sleeves to that it rubs off on those who we come in contact, who we greet and who we communicate with. So Boaz comes into the scene and at this point he is thought of as a wealthy, single, godly, elderly man from the clan of Ruth's deceased father-in-law who has been in town presumably and at the town gate officiating the affairs of the people with the other elders which would have been included the discussion of Naomi who has recently returned from Moab with a wid- as a widow but bringing her a Moabite daughter-in-law, who has converted to the Jewish faith and has vowed to care for Naomi and be part of their people. Setting the scene, hey? Now we look at Ruth. We look at Ruth. We move into this place where we see in these verses, Ruth was a foreigner and truly unsure of her surroundings seeks Naomi's permission to go and to glean in a nearby field, to get food for them to eat. Being a young woman with no father or no husband or no son, this would have been a dangerous place in this time for her to be out in the open, especially out on the fringes of town in the fields and the farming area. Ruth would have been... No, oh, sorry, Ruth would have to be cautious not to put herself in an unfavourable position where she may be exploited, harmed, or worst, killed. Our society hasn't changed, has it? 
All too often, our ladies have to be so cautious in where they are and at what time and who is around them, let alone a girl who was a foreigner, a person who did not have a father or a husband or a son who would be able to protect her and her honour. She was significantly vulnerable. She was in an unfavourable position where she may be exploited. There is, there, this is not an entirely safe task that she came to Ruth and said, can I, uh, Naomi, can I go and glean on the fields? I'm sure Ruth would have been a little nervous in going to work into these fields. She just so happened that she came across and began to work in the fields of a godly, honourable man, where the workers would have known that if they had done anything to Ruth, it would be met with scrutiny and justice from their employer. But rather, but Ruth didn't know that at that time. She would have been in this sense of uncertainty, a sense of uh, uncomfortableness knowing what, what, what may have been. And as she entered the field to glean, as instructed in the Levitical Deuteronomical laws, she didn't just assume that her right would be that she could go into that field and start to glean. But rather, she saw that even though this was going to be uncomfortable, in her humility, she went and seeked permission to glean in this field. We can learn from Ruth's character here. The last thing I'm sure she wanted to do in this vulnerable situation was to present herself to the men of the field, highlighting her position of lack. Rather, I'm sure her preferred would have been to quietly work in the corners of the field, trying to stay hidden and avoiding any attention. But that isn't what she did, was it? What she did was hard. What she did was the hard thing, the scary thing, the honourable thing. There at the times in our lives that we have to make a decision to do the hard things, like go and talk to people in awkward or risky situations, when it would be easier to just avoid and to hide and to hope that nothing comes from this situation. You know those hard times where you may see that something is wrong and you need to go and speak to them? Or you know that they, there's a situation that someone is hurting and struggling, and, but, but you need to go and talk to them? And you just, that so often people just turn around and go, that's somebody else's problem. Maybe there's a situation where someone has hurt you or you presume that someone has hurt you and you know that you need to go and deal with the situation and speak to them, but sometimes it's just easier to be quiet and just hide and just hope that it never pops its head up and shows itself in daylight again. But what does Ruth do? The honourable thing to do, the option that carries integrity is to go and affront the person and talk it out. Ruth wasn't going to be, if you remember my story about the cow and the bull, Ruth wasn't going to be the cow in this uncomfortable situation running from hard things, but Ruth again showed how she is the bull and faces the big situations front on. And God honours her here in this place. And if we are people who are willing to step out of our comfort zone and do what the right thing is, we also will see God honouring us when we do what we know is right. Secondly, we see Ruth's hard work. When Boaz sees her in the field and seeks to know who she is, or more importantly, in the extremely patriarchal country, a woman's identity at that time is based on her father on her husband, or on her son. And so Boaz, Boaz was inquiring of what family she came from to extinguish what status he should hold her by. And verse 7 continues, she has continued from early morning until now without resting even for a moment. Now verse 17 goes on to say that she gleaned until evening and then before she quit 
Um, and, and then before she quit, she beat out what she gleaned and measured it and took it home to Naomi. There is no doubt that the writer wants to admire and copy Ruth. She takes initiative to take care for her destitute mother-in-law. She is humble and meek and does not put herself forward presumptuously and she works hard from sun up to sundown. Initiative, lowliness, industrious, worthy traits. Worthy traits that we all could do well to carry. Now keep your eyes open and see if you see these same worthy traits again. Now here we get a greater sense of the merciful provisions of God. The merciful visions are behind all of this. Ruth so happened to glean in Boaz's field. Boaz just so happened to come across, come from town to the fields on that day and saw Ruth. Ruth just so happened to seek permission and work hard to provide for her mother-in-law. Boaz just so happened to have heard of her faithfulness and loyalty to Naomi. Why did all this just so happen? Because God is gracious and sovereign. Even when he is silent, as Proverbs 16 verse 9 says, a man's mind plans his way, but the Lord's directs his steps. Now in verse 8 and 9, Boaz approaches Ruth and shows her great kindness. Even though she is a foreigner, he provides food by telling her to work in the fields and stay close behind his maidens. He provides protection and telling the young men not to harm her. And he provides for her thirst by telling her to drink from what the men have drawn. So all of Boaz's wealth and godliness begins to turn to Ruth's welfare. Now we come to the most important interchange in, chapter, in this chapter. In chapter 2, verse 10 to 13, we see the first interaction of Ruth and Boaz. Ruth raises a question which turns out to be a very profound one as she experiences the blessing and the mercy of Boaz, it's it's one that we will all need to ask God. Hardly anything in our life is more important than asking and getting the answer of this question. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favour in your eyes that you should take notice of me? When I am a foreigner. I don't know about you, but there are moments in my life where I can see a pivotal road, where there is a fork in the road in my life, where I have come to a moment where I either say, it is me or it is God. There are these pivotal moments in our lives that we either through joy and celebration say, yes, praise to Phil, or wow, praise be to God. And in the sorrowful times and the struggles and the hardships that we get through our lives and we come to wonder and to come to question where we are and what's going on, we either can come and say, God, where are you? Or God, I know you're here. And lead me. And in this place, as we see Ruth in this situation, she comes to acknowledge the great mercies, the great provisions, and the goodness. And this is a praiseworthy place. And she comes and turns around, and she doesn't have a sense of pride. She doesn't have a sense of entitlement that she should and she deserves this. But rather, she came to a place of humility and thankfulness, acknowledging that. What she is receiving is beyond what she deserves. And she says, why? Why me? Why would you notice me when I am a foreigner? 
You know, there was a time in my life where there were situations like this. There was a moment in my life where when I was a teenager, I was coming out of high school and, 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 and I, had, I had got myself into a place where I had lots of accolades upon myself. I had been quite, uh, pretty good at my athletic ability. I then went and started. My brother got selected for the regional soccer team. And so he went to Toowoomba. I went with him. One of the um, players' mum's car broke down which had four players in it so they couldn't get there guess what I brought my own soccer shoes and I said just in case and so when we were in Toowoomba and they couldn't play because there was nothing they didn't have enough players guess who they came and asked me and when I got to play for the regional uh, the regional team there was a scout there for the Queensland state team and when they looked guess who they noticed me And so I got to then go and represent Queensland playing, I should say, futsal, indoor soccer. I got to go and play, present Queensland for futsal over in in the ACT at the Australian Institute of Sport. And we played. It was amazing. We got all the way to the grand final. And we got to, it was was for all at the end time. And we went to a penalty shootout. And guess who got to kick the final goal? Me. And then after that, we were at home and a letter came in the mail. Oh, wow. What's this? Open it up. Congratulations, Philip Monteith. You have been selected to represent Australia in the Australian football team. Where are you going to go over to Italy and Switzerland and Portugal and represent Australia over in those places? By the way, you're going to be also able to go and play in outdoor soccer in their scouting games to see if you might want to get scouted or have the ability to be scouted into one of the European soccer teams. So we went over to Italy and Switzerland and Portugal. I turned up. And I was playing in Italy. We started in, in, in down near um, the foot of Italy in a, in, in a, a Regina um, and, and where, you know, where all the mob and the mafia is and, and that place. And then after that, we went up to Rome and we got to play in the areas of Rome. And just outside of Rome, there was a soccer field, um, big stro- soccer, big institute place where there was like five immaculate fields around this hotel room. And I got to go and stay in that hotel room and we were playing against that area. First game in Rome before the Scouts games happened. I stepped into the field. I was playing and one of their players in Italy got a break down through the middle. The goalkeeper had already gone out to make a save before he was out of the goals. And so I decided I was going to take it for the team. He was going to kick it. It was going to hit my chest. And it hit me straight, fair, square, smack in my nose. I don't remember much after that. I was in a daze. Broken nose, when I came, my nose was swollen like crazy. I had a different voice than what I have now back then. I didn't have such a nasally voice. Actually, when I got home from Italy and I was in the car with mum and dad, they talked to me. By the time they got out of Kingsford Smith Drive, mum turned around to me and said, Philip, enough. Stop using that funny voice. And I went, sorry, mum, I can't. This is my voice now uh, because of my nose. But in that moment, I was sitting in the hotel room knowing that I wasn't going to play any more games of soccer while I was over there. And I was sitting there going, God, why? Why me? And it was one of these moments where I could either blame him or thank him. I could have laid in bed and complained and moaned and groaned and done nothing. Instead... I decided that I was going to make the best of the opportunity that I had while everybody else went to the 16th chapel or whatever those places are. I was in the hotel room. I'm going to go down and I'm going to go out and just sit in the sun and watch the teams that were there playing. I went down into the food area and I was sitting over there having, having a late breakfast and the guy came to me and asked me what I wanted. He could not speak a word of English. I could not speak a word of Italian. And so he was asking me and I, I just said, food. And, and then I said, Water. So he came and brought me a glass of tap water. Now, we were told specifically, don't have tap water. So I didn't. So then he brought me a bottle of sparkling water. 
Now, if anybody knows me, I hate sparkling water. And I said, no, I don't want sparkling. And so you could say, imagine an Italian guy, what do you want? What do you want? And there was another team on the other side of the floor area who was watching and laughing. And so they came over, three of them came over and sat next to me and said, hello, uh, would you like me to help you? And so we did. He, they ordered me some normal bottled water. And then they started chatting. And little did I know until that time of conversation, I was sitting with the under-21s Italian national soccer team, who then later, a couple of years later, were the men who played in the World Cup, who won the World Cup grand final. And I'm thinking, wow, oh God, that was amazing. I'm so thankful that I got to sit there and have a conversation with them. And you know what one of the questions that they asked me was when they were sitting there? Oh, what does your father do? And I got to say my dad was a pastor of a Baptist church. And we got to talk about what that meant to be a believer of Jesus, not in a Catholic church, where we got to celebrate a relationship one-on-one with God, where it was done by grace and mercy. At an age of 16 years of age, talking to one of the winners of the World Cup Italian soccer team, I got to share the gospel with them. Praise be to God. We have these moments where we could come and we could have these moments where we can say, God, why or God, what? What are you doing here? What do you want to do? Where are you taking me? And what are you wanting me to be a part of? And and God will bring joyful moments that we need to not be arrogant and push him aside and just see that it's all about me, but rather to sit in that place and praise God in the midst of those moments. And also in those hard times, we need to press into God and seek him and his direction in and through these hard times. We need to see the provisions that God is giving to us. Ruth, in this moment of joy of the provision, fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favour in your eyes that you should take notice of me? A foreigner. She is very different to most people today. We expect kindness and are astonished and resentful if we don't get what we believe we rightfully should receive. But Ruth expresses her sense of unworthiness by falling on her face and bowing to the ground. Proud people don't say thank you. Humble people are made even more humble by being treated graciously. Grace is not intended to lift us out of lowliness, but rather grace is intended to make us happy in the blessings and the provisions of God. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Ruth asked Boaz, why has he treated her so graciously? In verse 11 and 12, we see these crucial things. Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under those wings that you have come to take refuge. Notice this when Ruth asks why she is being shown grace. Boaz doesn't actually answer directly to her. Grace has no conditions. He answers her question, why, by saying, because you have loved Naomi so much that you are willing to leave your father and your mother and to serve her in a strange land. Boaz says in verse 12, and God is uh, really the one who is rewarding Ruth for her love to Naomi. It is because she sought refuge under God's wings. Boaz is only instru- is the instrument of God. As Ruth and Naomi will tell us next week. But now notice the words. The Lord repay you for what you have done. And a full reward be given you by the Lord. The God of Israel. Under whose wings you have come to take refuge. This verse 
This verse does not encourage us to picture Ruth as an employee of God providing needed labor, which he then, as an employer, rewards with a good wage. The picture is of God, of God's great wings covering over Ruth as a threatened legal, uh, little eaglet, coming to find safety under the eagle's wings. The implication of verse 12 is that God will reward Ruth because she has sought refuge under his wings. Now, why should God show mercy to Ruth? Because she has sought refuge under his wings. She has counted his protection better than all others. She has set her heart on God for hope and joy. And when a person does that, God's honor is at stake and he will be merciful. If you plead God's value as the source of your hope instead of pleading your value as the source of God's hope, then his unwavering commitment to his own values engages all his heart for your protection and joy. Stop seeking how and why you deserve, but rather seek the promises and the will of God and his refuge. So now back to Ruth's question in verse 10. Why have I found favour? Well, the answer is that she has taken refuge under the wings of God and that this has been given her freedom and desire to leave home and love Naomi. She has not earned mercy from God or Boaz. She is not their employee. They are not paying her wages for her work. On the contrary, she has honoured them by admitting her need for their work and simply taking refuge in their generosity. And this is the message of the gospel. This is the message of the gospel in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God will have mercy on anyone, a Palestinian, an Israelite, an Australian, even a Kiwi. (laughs) Who humbles himself like Ruth and takes refuge under the wings of God. And Jesus said, as he spoke to the Pharisees, looking at their arrogance, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who have sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate. All the Pharisees had to do was to take refuge under the wings of Jesus, Stop justifying themselves. Stop relying on themselves. Stop glorifying themselves, but they would not. Ruth was not their model. Not falling on their face before Jesus. Not bowing down. Not astonishment of grace. Don't be like the Pharisees. Be like Ruth. God is not an employer looking for employees. He is an eagle looking for for people who will take refuge under his wings. He is looking for people who will leave their father and their mother and their homeland or anything else that may hold us back from a life of love under the wings of Jesus. Let us find refuge under the wings of Jesus and let us experience the provisions of mercy that God offers like Ruth experiences in these passages. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you that you let us be in all seasons. There are times of sorrow and times of celebration. Lord, we thank you that there are times where we need to be able to marvel at your grace and your mercy and your provisions of generosity and times where we need to come and seek you and seek your mercy, call upon your name and see how you are gracious to us. I pray, Lord, that those who are here that are struggling in this time, that they will find shelter in your wings. And Lord, I pray for those who are finding favour and celebrating joy. I pray that they will bring a worship offering to you, thanking you for what you have done. Lord, let us be people with humility and gratitude. Let us be people who celebrate that you are with us always and forever, guiding us and protecting us in each and every day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I step down, 
I want to be able to celebrate God's provision to us through our beautiful Jill. She shared a little bit of her story this morning where 12 years ago, what happened 12 years ago? 12 and a half years ago? Um, Yeah, I was starting my cancer journey and uh, had been just finished all my initial surgery, chemo, radiation stuff, (laughs) feeling a bit chewed up and spat out. And shortly after that, my long marriage ended and I found myself on my own. And um, God became my husband and my provider. And he said to me, I have a future for you. And in those moments, in those struggles, in that emptiness, in that sense of longing for what is to come, you heard those words that God is saying, I want you to look forward, not backwards. And then just recently in 2023, your cancer process has come back. And we didn't even know in that space, the language was that we didn't even know if you were going to be able to sing up on our Christmas carols, of the carols of 2023. I didn't know if I'd be on earth last Christmas. <laughs> and yet she is here. And not only just at Christmas time, but seven months later, she is with us because God's provision is for you to be here bringing songs of worship to our great God and joining to us in his service in our church. We have a great God, a merciful God, a God that wants to provide and a God that has made promises that one day our time will not be here on earth but celebrating at the beautiful heavenly feast with our heavenly Father in Christ Jesus. We can hold to that too. future awaiting me. Can I pray for Jill before I hop off? Gracious Father, we want to thank you for the privilege to be able to journey this journey with our dear sister. Lord, we thank you for her strength of faith and her willingness to be able to be a bull that confronts the storm face on, knowing that you are there with her, that you will never leave or forsake her. I thank you, Lord, that you have allowed her to face that with joy in her heart, that you have sung a song not just through her lips, but through her actions and her life. And we pray, Lord, for many, many, many beautiful, joyful times to come. I pray, Lord, that you'll strengthen her even in the hard times of chemo. Lord, let her have patience and compassion. And may you speak through her to all who bear witness of what you have done in her life, where she can see and speak the greatness of your great love and your salvation in her and to others so that they may experience it too. We thank you, Jesus, for Jill and the joy that she has. We pray this in Jesus' name. God's people say, can we give her a round of applause? Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. You shelter me under your wings like an eagle. You have hold of me by your righteous right hand. You have not dropped me. You will not let me go. You provide for me. Let's put our trust in God, our trust in his word, that it is true and holy. There is none like our God. Let's stand and acknowledge him. Lift our eyes to him.
Jesus, the name of all, every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. of your word, your word that tells us that you love us, as we've remembered in communion this morning that you sacrificed your life for us, to give us the way to be eternally with you in the glory of heaven. Thank you for that blessing, that joy, that hope. It's not just a wishy-washy hope. It's a hope with a strength and a foundation. And, oh, Lord, thank you for that. Be with us this week. May we seek you, find you, live life with you, and share the joy of you with our family, our neighbours, those we work with, those we come across. Lord, just be with us this week. We seek you, we desire you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Enjoy some morning tea, enjoy some fellowship together. Yeah, thank you.
see 